from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. At Cloud Next, Google showcased its strong leadership position in AI. In our view, Google's messaging, its demos, and tech-centric narrative have broad appeal for developers and next-generation startups. As well, the company's focus on solutions contrasts its strategy to the typically disjointed services that we've seen coming out of AWS over the past decade. Google also showed off an expanded ecosystem of GSIs and smaller cloud service providers, encouraging the broad use of Google's kit globally. While Google remains a distant third in the cloud race with, within the IaaS and PaaS you know, revenue perspective, it's one fifth the size of AWS, for example. It is playing the long game and betting the house on AI as a catalyst to its cloud future. Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we unpack the key takeaways from Google Cloud Next with Rob Streche and George Gilbert. We'll share ETR data that positions Google's AI relative to other leaders and we'll contrast Google's data-centric strategy with traditional architectural models. We want to start with the key takeaways from Google Cloud Next. John Furrier called it the Google trifecta. Trifecta, developers, solutions, and ecosystems. They showed off a very rapid pace of advancement with Gen AI, co-pilots everywhere with low code and no code solutions, and frameworks for developers. And Google accelerated compute, which brings more optionality in a world of GPU shortages. This enables Gen AI across all of its products. And the caveat, of course, is you got to use Google Stack. Google introduced the most advanced integrated data and AI platform that we've seen to date, showing a data-centric versus a DBMS-centric vision, which we'll discuss. We also saw a major focus on security, full dev SecOps, just when Microsoft is embarrassed again with another security failure. Let's start with you, Rob. You were at the show, 20,000 attendees at Moscone, sold out. How was the show? What would you add? Uh, so first off, the, the show was fantastic. It was, I, I think, had a ton of energy. And, and I, if I contrast it to the week before with uh, VMware Explore, it, it was, the show floor was packed every moment of the day. All the demos, all of the different showing off, like they had a Wendy's drive through that you could actually see the AI in action. Uh, it did give me the wrong thing. It added extra bacon to my order. When I didn't not a problem. Add, not which is a good a good if it's gonna if it's gonna go wrong, adding extra bacon is always the thing to do. So it and part of it was saying you know they talked about their process for putting the demos together. Uh, we actually had the CTO for uh, Google Cloud on, and he was talking about how it may have that may have been on purpose. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm I'm good with that. Uh, I I thought you know again the the drumbeat of the overall for me the drumbeat of the developer to John's points about being developer centric was key to where they were going talking about pluggability open source and APIs and also reuse of extensible layers or extensibility layers I, I think that was kind of the three things they kept coming back to and w was killer now, George, you were watching remote as was I. Uh, we're going to go deeper into some of the thoughts on, on architectures, but any other takeaways that you had? Well, m well my big takeaway is that um, Gen AI is the biggest accelerant this the tech industry has ever seen. We've gone through big platform transitions, GUI, the browser, mobile, and the cloud, but we've never had a technology that accelerates both the demand for applications, as well as the ability to, to build and, and essentially add to the supply of applications. Most of them have accelerated demand, but this turbocharges your ability to build new applications as we'll get into. And um, really, uh, we're only constrained right now by the supply of infrastructure, Dave, as you mentioned, that's been an NVIDIA bottleneck, but more than anyone, um, I would say that that Google, having anticipated the need for acceleration, built out an infrastructure, not just of now fifth generation TPUs, but an infrastructure that knows how to put them together. And that's why they have 
the capacity to put Gen AI across all their products, whereas Microsoft internally was rationing access to GPUs. And as we'll get into, um, I think that's why uh, Gen AI was pervasive that we saw everywhere within their products. Okay, so it's well, I mean, it's well known that Google is you know, a distant third, I think I said one fifth the size of AWS, but let's take a look at some ETR data that shows the overall Google spending profile. Uh, let me explain this chart in some details. This shows the granularity of ETR's proprietary net score methodology. Net score is a measure of spending momentum. The lime green uh, boxes uh, show new customer ads. You can see in the July survey, 8% of the customers surveyed were new. Uh, to Google, and then the forest green is, is, represents customers spending 6% or more, that's 37%. The gray is flat spending, that's a big chunk of Google's profile, as it is with most vendors these days. Uh, and then the red, sorry, the pinkish area at 7%, that's spending down 6% or worse. And then the 4% bright red, that's churn, you subtract the reds from the greens and you get a net score of 34.8%. That's that blue line that's sort of been descending, but then popped up after the April survey. The yellow line is pervasiveness in the data set. In other words, it takes the total N of Google divided by the total N of the entire survey, which is around 1700, and that measures sort of the share within the survey. But watch what happens if you isolate only on Google's AI performance. So you see here, net score bottoms in October 2022, the month before ChatGPT is announced, we were seeing the, the slow deceleration of, of AI ML spend uh, post pandemic. And then Google responds with BARD, other AI tooling throughout the year. And you can see its next net score jumps to 52.1%. Now we should note that despite Google's AI prowess, it still ranks lower than the other big cloud players, Microsoft and AWS. We're going to show you some comparison data in a moment, but, but Rob and George, Google's momentum, it's, it's headed in the right direction. And based on what we saw at Google Next, they intend to make inroads. Rob, your thoughts. Yeah, and, and I, I kind of said this a little bit while I was out there and doing some of the wrap ups, uh, but I think that their ability to put AI everywhere is because of their architecture and how their compute layer, how their storage layer, how all of their applications and solutions are put together. And I think that allowed them like to put it across workspaces, similar to what Microsoft is doing with Office 365 uh, with OpenAI, but I think it was even more so pervasive across even more of their solutions because they own all of those solutions and they are solutions on a single platform that has been architected in a way to take advantages. I, I think that is something that I don't know how AWS is going to tackle that because basically all of the 300 plus, 380 plus services they have are kind of individual children and they have to have some common layer. So maybe they can go and put it in the console. You can have it with tech, you know, tech docs and stuff like that. They'll probably have to build something into it. Each service will probably be required to it. But I think it's going to be hard for AWS to really step up and be either number one or number two in this part of the market. Well, I mean, this definitely has, has played off of its SageMaker expertise. There's, there was an article in the information this week about sort of inside how AWS is behind an AI and they sort of, uh, Charles Fitzgerald came out with his sort of weekly blog kind of crapping on AWS and the PR people there, he calls it the Gen AI list company or something like that. But, but I, I think that sort of um, actually understates uh, uh, AWS's AI chops. And I do, st do think it's early in the game, but George, your point was that because of Google's infrastructure, Google is not as constrained on, uh, on GPU, uh, uh, not as reliant on GPU, for training and developing some of these models and using its AI. Can you explain your premise there? Yeah, Dave, I, I, I want to build though on something that Rob said about AWS having you know hundreds of these independent services. Um, that's a, a different mindset that AWS has compared to Google and Microsoft. And I think that's why AWS was caught a bit flat-footed and why they're behind in at least Gen AI, because both Google 
and Microsoft saw this coming and they had all their other services they considered part of a software platform. They have a software platform mindset. And so they replatformed the, those services all to take advantage of Gen AI, whereas AWS has a hardware platform mindset and hundreds of services to make the hardware more useful. But when a new software technology came along, they did not see it as a strategic opportunity to replatform all the services. And so one, they are constrained now in the infrastructure they have available, the GPU accelerators um, that they have available, but they also are behind in the core tooling that all those services would use to embed the equivalent of co-pilots. So they're still struggling to get out their bedrock basic Gen AI uh, development and customization tooling. And without that, they can't really get started embedding it in all the other services. So that's, there was the mindset problem, there was the delay problem, and then there's the infrastructure sort of rationing problem. You know, uh, John Furrier on theCUBE this week talked about how most developers who were in their 20s, they grew up using Google Docs and Gmail and they have an affinity toward Google. I think Google said that, I don't know, I think it was 70% of the unicorn AI vendors uh, using Correct. Uh, uh, Google. It was kind of the, there was sort of this undertone of, AWS is like the boomer cloud. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, I, I believe we, I believe he even said that it was the boomer <laughs> cloud. And I, I think what was I think to George's point, I think that and having been at AWS and seen how all these services are put together and all layer caked on top of each other, I think it's going to be difficult for them to catch up in this. And I. I Again, AWS also doesn't play for third place. They always play for first. So it'll be interesting to see how they really approach this going into reInvent in the next couple months here. Well, speaking of the horses on the track, here's a, a comparison with, with all the, well, not all of them, but the, the AI leaders that are, many of them that are in the ETR uh, data set. The chart shows uh, net score or spending momentum, that's the vertical axis and the, and the penetration in the data set or overlap on the x-axis, the, there's that inserted chart in the bottom right that informs how the dots are plotted. And the key points are, I mean, first of all, look at OpenAI. It's got an 88% net score and it's got 314 citations. So I, these, are, these are IT decision makers saying, we're using a, a OpenAI tooling. That N is only second to the ever ubiquitous Microsoft. And of course, Microsoft is OpenAI. So it's sort of, you know, you're, you could probably double count that. Uh, but so this is really people responding directly on OpenAI and then indirectly on Microsoft. So you could probably add them together. And most of that is OpenAI. So, but Microsoft has catapulted itself into a leadership position with that, with that relationship. AWS, as I said, has been a major player with SageMaker, but that's kind of like yesterday's AI. And now with Bedrock and Titan and other Gen AI tooling, it, it's, you know, it's still showing strong momentum. People, it's got a big install base and people using it. Databricks shows very strong in this chart. We've got spending momentum, it's got net score above that 40% red dotted line. That, that's always an indication of a highly elevated net score. And you can see Google's progress with that squiggly orange line, a very impressive move to the right. Although I would say, so did you know Microsoft make a big move to the right. And then you see the rest of the pack with Spark Cognition, Data Robot, Data IQ, Anthropic, who got some press at, uh, at, at Google Cloud Next, H2O.ai, C3's in there. And interestingly, you see IBM and Oracle, they're in the mix, you know, at their lower, obviously in the momentum axis, but they show up in the survey. So guys, the point here is that while Google is strong, it still has a lot of work to do to catch up in, in market performance. Will Google's strong technical position in AI, in your opinion, change the game in cloud? If, if not, why not? And if so, Rob, when? Yeah, I, I think that what's interesting about Google is instead of trying to play the IaaS and PaaS game like AWS was forcing Microsoft to kind of play. They've kind of said, let's go to our home, our home field advantage, which is AI. And I think they went back to solutions. They're doubling down on workspaces. And I, I think it does help them. I think that it helps with their momentum. I think this was a big, a big coming out party for, hey, we're the AI cloud. I think you and I had talked about this. The only people who'd really like talked about LLMs as a service was HPE. 
and the one the cloud they're building. This this was LLMs as a service. I mean, this the, the the Vertex AI stuff that they're doing definitely was a way for them to push in on that and really, I, I think, strengthen their position. I think it will definitely help them in cloud. I definitely help think it will help them in the IaaS and PaaS stuff as well. George, let's get into some of your graphics here. I want to dig into some of the announcements and the architectures Google showcased at Next. Here's a slide. Uh, that George put together. Uh, the pyramid up top underscores the evolution of data apps. We've often used Uber, and we saw George has added Amazon.com. These are leading examples of highly advanced companies that have a lot of engineers and deep technical expertise. And George, there's a lot of data on this chart. Maybe you could explain it and both, you know, George and Rob, address whether you think Gen, I, Gen AI will accelerate the industry more than, for example, George, you were talking before about the GUI, the browser, mobile phones, the cloud, and how you see Google relative to the competition, George. Okay, so, so let me start by drilling a bit into why this is an accelerator that we've never seen before. Um, on the demand side, um, simplifying the user interface takes it, uh, takes applications into contexts and use cases they've they've uh, the industry hasn't reached before GUI browser mobile um only this time we're we've only really seen part of the advance on the demand side we're probably going to see by the end of the year agents these are these go beyond the chat interface where they can actually take action on behalf of the user it's like a Siri that works and does stuff for you um and but on on the supply side as we've talked about it turbocharges software development unlike anything we've ever seen before. And just in terms of where um, where this where Google is relative to the other vendors, first, Gen AI favors um, the hyperscalers because they have hundreds of building blocks that Gen AI can glue together as far as uh, as part of platform engineering. Um, Eventually, we'll be able to take a multi-vendor stack um, and accelerate that as well. But that happens only once the market agrees on a multi-vendor stack. Where um, Snowflake and Databricks fit in is they've been the, the data and AI layer on Amazon and Azure for the most part, because those vendors have relatively weak data and AI layers. Um, Specifically um, on, on uh, AWS, we talked about um, how they're constrained uh, with their infrastructure capacity and they're really primitive uh, with their Gen AI development tools. They've not even shipped it yet. And there's been reporting in the press that even the reference customers they cited um, are saying it's not ready for prime time. Um, with Azure, Google is, is way ahead uh, in terms of development tools um, and security uh, for Gen AI. Um, and we'll we'll talk about this more when we get into the um, the uh, data and AI layer. But Microsoft emphasized at their build conference more the um, embedding uh, co-pilots in desktop productivity and low code development tools. And they had it somewhat in their fabric uh, data layer, but Google was much more pervasive in putting Gen AI as an accelerator in, in the coding of all their services. That might be because they are less capacity constrained on the infrastructure side, um, or it might be that they're just farther ahead in development. So Rob, on this chart, George has a, a notation on BigQuery. Obviously Google wants to push BigQuery as its, its, as its primary, a primary data platform. Uh, and, and we reported last week, we talked about how you know, Snowflake's got momentum in AWS and now Microsoft, probably Google is not next, you know, the play on the upcoming conference because Google really wants to push its own data platform. Having said that, and so that's probably why you don't, you don't see as many database companies at Google Next. You do see, you know, maybe some smaller booths from Snowflake and, and Databricks, you mentioned that. But then this other notation here on, on governance, what was that governance ecosystem like? Yeah, I think the governance ecosystem was actually pretty robust. And I, I think that was one of the things, the data quality aspects, 
even though Google has its own tooling and was talking about that, I think that you saw a more robust, uh, I guess you could say, ISV ecosystem around data quality, data governance, data security is still there. I think when we talked uh, to the Googlers about it, you know, what, where is the white space? Uh, and I think that is definitely still part of where the white space is. I think also, uh, you know, with George's pyramid there, I, I think, you know, with Palm at the bottom and Looker and BigQuery and Vertex AI, I think also it's not just Palm that they have there. It's, it's Cohere, it's uh, AI21 Labs and their models. So it's, I think it's beyond just their models and they've brought a lot of... Uh, a lot of the pieces together. And so they are building an eco, an AI ecosystem. Uh, I think there's, to your point, the fact that Databricks was really late to the game going to GCP and being able to be on top of their, uh, their open, uh, I guess you could say their object storage. Uh, they only launched, I think, towards the tail end of last year, uh, just getting onto Google. So I, I think, again, it's probably because of demand. And I think George's point was really key. And actually it made me think just now that, hey, maybe, maybe this is an opportunity for Databricks with AWS to really be that platform layer for AI for them because I, I could see that being a huge play. Uh, and if I was Databricks sellers, that's, I'd go be buddies with uh, my AWS sellers even more so than I am now. Yeah, I mean, if Google is really kind of pushing for instance, Snowflake and maybe Databricks away, it opens the door for, for both Databricks and Snowflake with AWS to come up, to, to provide a you know, stronger product perhaps than they, they do with the Microsoft Cloud um, yeah. with Azure, we get you know, better security and so forth. But, uh, but it's an interesting dynamic, but Google very clearly is you know, doubling down and wants to really push its data stack. All right, this next graphic is sort of the flywheel chart and talks to how Google's product portfolio across infrastructure, data, and AI reinforce each other. And guys, let's talk about the various tools Google showcased at Next, in particular Vertex AI, the framework, and Duet, um, which is more the solution-oriented chat capability and how they fit and are embedded within Google's uh, growing portfolio. So George, start by explaining the key points of this chart. And in your view, did Google make a strong case that its data and AI platform is more advanced relative to the competition? Um, in a word, yes. And let me let me hit the high level of the four points and then drill down on one and we can go point by point um, interactively. But most important, we're seeing um, a profound shift to a data-centric architecture among many of the platforms where it's managed, the, the data is center stage. There are no pipelines, multiple compute engines, all talk to one system of truth. This is a profound change um, that, that we're seeing. And part of the reason is cost effectiveness. That's the thing we missed or I missed before, which is it's too expensive to go through one DBMS as gatekeeper, even if that DBMS is giving you transactional integrity that having multiple compute engines can't offer um, in equivalent functionality. Um, the, the big universal storage here is Big Lake. It actually manages all data types, structured and unstructured, and it runs also on Amazon and Azure. Um, and the fact that you have universal storage means you have no pipelines or no silos. All the different engines, whether it's BigQuery, Vertex, Dataproc or Spark, or the streaming or third-party engines can all access, manipulate, and enrich this one system of truth. And what's going on is we're unbundling the DBMS. And it's a profound shift in data applications architecture where all the compute engines share one storage engine. Um, and the DBMS is no longer the gatekeeper. Now, um, there is advantage to having a DBMS centric architecture where that system of truth is you, you have greater integrity, but customers seem to be choosing choice and cost effectiveness and losing some of the transactional integrity. Let me stop at that point and then we can go through this and the other points one by one. 
Yeah, so Rob, anything you'd add to this? Yeah, I, I think, again, this really shows off where Duet was one of the big advances for them was this chatbot across everything, this simple, easy way to get from workspaces all the way to Vertex AI to, you know, Collab Notebook and really have a simple way of using the tooling. And I, I think this plays to where, you know, the position that it was in the pyramid as well is that, you know, again, it's more a solution for the masses versus just being for experts. If you're an expert, you can go in and use it basically in expert mode and you still get a lot of the differentiated value that Google is providing to you, even if you're not as advanced. And I, I think that to me was the key is that, you know, they know there's limitations to what Duet can do. So they had Duet working in, in one of the demos, Duet working in uh, coordination to help build an app inside of workspaces that then built an app inside of Vertex to do some uh, image recognition using the Palm model. So I, I thought it was really good at how they were bringing this all together. I think the story just hits and I think George's comment on having that common storage layer, they actually didn't hammer as much as I thought they would when they came up uh, and in the, they weren't hammering it as much in their keynotes as well. Uh, I, I was kind of surprised about that. Uh, we had on the head of storage and he hit it. He talked about files. I, mean, I guess they had an announcement around files that wasn't in their prep docs or anything like that as well. So storage, they yeah, I mean, they buried, they buried <laughs> that. So, I mean, I was, it, it might, as I said on the thing, it made my head explode in a good way when he actually mentioned storage for the first time. But I, I think, again, they, their, their goal is offer a solution, offer an app, not IaaS or PaaS. I, I think there, I mean, although you could call Vertex AI a PaaS, sure. I guess you could. But but, 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 the, but the low code, no code, you know, movement, had, I always felt like it was kind of elusive, but it really is on in full force, you know, yeah. at Google Next this, this past week. All right, bring up that slide again, Alex, if you would, George. You've got some other key points here I think that you wanted to hit. Go ahead. Yeah, let me, I want to build on something both you and Rob said, um, one about Duet and, and one about low code, and they're related, which is, again, Duet AI, which is their co-pilot. You know, Microsoft has sort of popularized the, the, the concept of the co-pilot. Um, it's a coding accelerator. It generates, um, it explains existing code, um, it synthesizes help. It's a tremendous productivity accelerator for developers. And Dave, to your point, they emphasize the low code to tool app sheet with Duet very heavily in the keynote. Um, and I think they're probably feeling some pressure because um, Copilot was used so pervasively throughout the low code power platform. And power platform for Microsoft is now the essentially application building layer that's low code and it's used both for um, dynamics, it's used for office and it's used for Azure. That was a very strategic bet by Microsoft that you would have this application development environment that is for um, non-professional developers and they are now accelerating it with Copilot. So we saw heavy emphasis on AppSheet, which is a good deal more, more primitive, but Google feels like they need to showcase this capability. Um, but taking Duet, they also showed it within BigQuery. So where you're doing things like um, you're cleaning and preparing and discovering um, and visualizing data, um, you might be using SQL, Python. Um, it's in uh, a Spark uh, notebook. All of that can be accelerated by Duet as their code generator. Databricks showed something similar with Lakehouse IQ, but this was more of a demonstration, a very advanced demonstration, but not shipping yet. So they're trying to show something different where they understand more about that data that an LLM has been fine tuned on. And that can help you build not just queries, but it can help you build full applications. You know, uh, I asked, it's just a quick aside, uh, just watching from afar, 
they were trying to convey that they were kind of the cool kids, right? There was the, the demos, there was a lot of enthusiasm, which oftentimes you don't see at, at Google, you know? A lot of times you see really technical people out there and they're not too excited, but they had, they had a lot of energy, uh, as you've, you've pointed out. I think the other thing too is, you know, in some of the you know, early keynotes, they sort of depositioned the legacy, sort of, I think, positioning Amazon and, and Microsoft as the old guard, you know, to use an Amazon ter term. And Kieran even said that in our conversations with customers, they want to work with leading edge, the leading edge technology. So it's almost like, you know, if you can't fix it, feature it, right? Because Google's been criticized for the lack of sort of go-to-market prowess. They just sort of always focus on the technology piece of it. They're really trying to turn that into an yeah. advantage. Yeah, no, I, I think that they really put full force into, hey, we're, we're, where you want to build your apps. Your kids are going to want to build their apps there. I, I, I even said it, my son who's at Arizona State getting his CS degree, I, I don't, he'll, he's n almost never used Amazon. Yeah, he he and he actually would say, "Hey, that's your boomer, uh, your boomer cloud boomer over there cloud. that you worked for." <laughs> so, uh, but I, I think it's it's actually really interesting. I know he's used Git, and it, so again, I think it's it's going to be a fight for the hearts and minds. But he's I don't think he's ever used Word on a laptop, uh, you know, independently. So I, I think again, you get to these workspaces, app sheet, how the AI and Duet tie together. I did ask because in George's uh, slide there where it had Looker and uh, BigQuery with Duet, I thought what was interesting is in the demo they showed to us on a little tour that they gave us of that, of the demos of Looker and BigQuery with Duet, what was funny is that I asked the question, did you have to have Looker on top of BigQuery to get the advantages of Duet? And they said, one person said yes, and one person said no, and, and I was like, so I think they're still trying to figure out, I think to that go to market, there's still some work to be done on, you know, what, do you, what pieces do you need to be there to get full advantage? And I think that'll be key. Well, they're obviously pushing Looker, although the ETR data shows that while they're pushing it, the momentum is dropping. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, BigQuery is the dominant, you know, we were looking at the ETR data, some of the double clicks that we're not showing here, but but BigQuery is is the dominant, you know, platform today versus some of the operational databases. But in terms of the adoption, it's very, very high. Right. George, were there other uh, parts of this chart you want to hit on or should we move on? Um, I just want to, I do want to drill down quickly on, on the, bullets two, three, and and four. But I do want to add to what Rob said about like boomer clouds. I think what's going on with the energy, Rob, that you observed at the show is that Google is becoming the go-to platform for tech-centric companies um, where Amazon still doesn't have a data platform. And if tech-centric companies were using Amazon as a platform, they were either using Snowflake or, or Databricks um, but Google's um, data and AI platform now is so strong that a tech company that, you know, in, in the past decade would have grown up on Amazon now will grow up on, on Google and they'll probably move their um, data centric workloads um, to Google. All right, George, hit on your points that you want to make on this slide. Let's wrap this up. Okay, just really quick as an example of how strategic and coherent the platform is. Um, BigQuery uses Vertex, Vertex uses BigQuery, and Dataplex, the governance underpins it all. Really quickly, um, like with uh, within BigQuery, it can call out to Vertex without moving the data, without any pipelines. It can call Gen AI models that might uh, generate personalized email or might summarize uh, documents or extract structured information and then enrich a structured record. This is how the pieces fit together. And this is something Amazon can't do. And frankly, um, so far, Microsoft hasn't been able to show it, although they're a little closer. I'll leave it at that and, and we can move on. Great, thank you, George. Um, a couple of things we didn't hit on, uh, Rob. I mean, there was a big focus on security. You know, Mandiant Plus. Yes. You know, Mandiant has a, a, a show coming up um, in a month or so. You know, its own show in DC. So they they Google acquired Mandiant late last year. So that was a big focus. Uh, and then the other is multi-cloud. 
I think it was either Sundar or maybe it was Thomas, uh, talked about their networking, cross-cloud networking across any clouds, networking super cloud, if you will. Touch on those two and anything sure. else that stood out. Yeah, so I, I thought the Mandiant uh, duet in Mandiant for threat intelligence, again, bringing the co-pilot to the SOC, I guess you could say, the uh, you know, security operations center, made a lot of sense. I think that especially when you and we, we talked to the folks uh, from security, the VP of security for Google uh, Cloud, and we had this discussion about how there's a, still a skills gap and that you need to bring these AI tools because the threat from all of the bad actors is using these types of tools as well and going faster. So you have to be able to respond faster. AI is helping with that, bringing it to Chronicle, bringing it to the Security Command Center. Uh, they also had Mandy and Hunt for uh, Chronicle. Uh, and they have some more stuff and we'll be at Mandiant. In fact, I'll be at Mandiant. Uh, they are MY's uh, conference in DC in a couple weeks. And we know that there's going to be even more coming out at, at that. And I think it's critical that they brought the AI. And to, this goes back to George's original thing. I mean, the platform, it's a platform with AI in it. And it's not just a you know, strung together bunch of uh, co-pilots. I also thought, to your point on the networking thing, it's very interesting. Uh, I think they're looking at it as how do we move data between places faster? How do we help that? It kind of was a, uh, I guess you could say, homage to the AWS WAN, the Amazon WAN stuff that they did last year uh, or two years ago even. And I think that the networking is still one of the biggest problems in cloud. Helping solve that is definitely going to help. Uh, I was actually surprised there weren't more partners in that announcement uh, to, you know, and I think maybe that's still coming and we'll start to hear some more about that. Uh, the other thing that the Google Cloud, uh, Google Distributed Cloud, I thought personally, I think that was one of the ones that flew under the radar. They had uh, Alloy DB Omni, which can actually run uh, disconnected, not in the cloud on any Docker uh, container instance. So you can run it on your laptop. The fact that they're bringing more to the enterprise, and it's not just hardware that they're bringing to the enterprise, but they're bringing a full stack. They talked about GKE Enterprise. I kind of said, well, that kind of spells the death of Anthos. You know, we'll see how that plays out. Um, I think GKE Enterprise, you know, multi-cluster is still going to have a tough time competing uh, in that market. I think, uh, I personally think that Red Hat is just so far ahead with OpenShift. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, if anybody's going to be able to do it, it's the guys who created Kubernetes, so. And you also saw, you know, the, and it, it's about time, but you saw a bigger presence from the GSIs, PwC, Deloitte, Slalom, Cognizant, probably missing HTC, some. HTC, yeah. Wipro, Infosys, yeah, they were, they, everybody was there. I mean, and most of them were on with us, and I, I think, you know, from Deloitte to PwC to HCL, uh, we had discussions, just deep discussions about why Why now? Why invest now? A billion dollars. I think it was it, PwC, Deloitte, uh, Infosys, they were all investing. I think everybody uses a billion dollars. I guess that's the nomenclature now to build a, uh, a dedicated Over one year, unit. two years, five years, yeah, 10 years, yeah, right? it's, it's a billion. It's a billion. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good number to throw out there. So I, I thought that it was good to see them there and I think that really helps with the ecosystem because this, to me, brought it back to what they're strong at, which is they're strong at the people and the process. Technology has gotten easier with AI. So we had the head of uh, AI and data from PwC on, and we talked about that and about, you know, they can now focus on bringing really strong processes and people to that AI to make people more or make companies move faster. And I, I think that was key to what they were doing there. All right, George, we'll give you the last word. Um, bring us home. I think reinforcing the theme we've been talking about for a while, we're seeing a shift from building cloud apps to building cloud data apps that are intelligent. In other words, you're using data coming from the real world to 
um, program and then to be informed by AI models that control um, or instrument people, places, things, and activities. And I think we're witnessing the emergence of this platform. So it's a molting of the basic infrastructure and the emergence of a data and AI platform as the new place uh, to build applications. And I think Google has a very um, coherent and powerful story. Um, I think it's probably the leader among tech-centric companies. I think they're limited by their go-to-market reach in terms of reaching mainstream enterprises. But I would say it's now um, a three-way um, battle between Google, Databricks, and Snowflake. And then um, Microsoft and Amazon are, are still in catch-up mode. Guys, thanks so much, George. Uh, Rob, flying the red eye in for the breaking analysis. Good job, really appreciate your guys' time and insights and uh, look forward to uh, the next show with you all. All right, many thanks to Alex Meyerson, who's on production and manages the podcast, Ken Schiffman as well. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on our social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our editor-in-chief over at siliconangle.com. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts. Wherever you listen, all you got to do is search for Breaking Analysis Podcasts. We publish each week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. If you want to get in touch, if you got a pitch, email me, david.vellante at siliconangle.com. We get a lot of inbound, so don't be insulted if we don't respond. Uh, DM me at dvellante or comment on my LinkedIn post. And please do check out etr.ai, the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. They're continually adding more to their taxonomy and doing more drill downs. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE Insight, powered by ETR. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.